I know we've been talking a lot today about Lori Vallo, but the judge split these trials up. And so now that the sentencing is over for Lori, we now can sort of look ahead and move on to Chad. Um, so just from a 30,000 foot level, people need to kind of change the gears and change their mind and mm -hmm. say, okay, Lori's done now, now let's focus on Chad. Sort of where do we go from here with this? Are we kind of starting all over? We are starting all over. Um, the prosecution is gonna have to put on the guilt portion of the, of the case yet again. Uh, so all the witnesses that they need to testify to get evidence in or testimony in, I think we'll probably see the same law enforcement uh, and forensic uh, witnesses. There may be some different witnesses um, that know about things that Chad did that didn't come in in Lori's trial uh, for a variety of reasons. So it really could look like an entirely different trial, uh, but for you know the, the similarity and in, in the, the facts of the actual murders. So I was gonna ask, this isn't just like hit and repeat. No, Here. it's not. It's not. And his his defense strategy will probably be entirely different than uh, Lori's defense team strategy. So this could be, you know, outside of, of hearing about, you know, the, the murders and the kids and kind of the, the crossover facts. This could be an entirely different trial. And I actually expect it to be. Um, do we expect maybe, possibly, him to say, there's your killer right there. Not me, there's your killer. I don't know why he wouldn't. I mean, she's been convicted. Uh, they, the, you know, the, the jury uh, was pretty decisive uh, in her role in it. And so I think it's an easier defense for him to say that, you know, I was, I was along for the ride maybe, or, or I didn't know, but she did it. Mm -hmm. Do you think the prosecution, I mean, obviously the burden, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, does this one conviction make it more difficult for them uh, in some regards? Yes and no. Uh, in some ways, I think it makes it easier where you, you have established that there was a murder okay. um, and they've established conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And so because they've established the conspiracy, it makes it a little bit easier uh, for them to get to Chad, it, at least through uh, that line. Mm -hmm. sure. um, in terms of who actually uh, murdered uh, the children, it, it may make it a little bit more difficult if he can stand there and point the finger. You know, the forensic, the, the limited forensic evidence that we have did not necessarily point to Chad. It actually, you know, it was Lori's hair that they found and, and some things like that. And so, you know, they're gonna have a, you know, a little bit of a tougher road, I think, on that end, tying him to the actual killing. Do they need to get the murder one charge for this death penalty case to move forward? I mean, that's, that's what it would have to be, right? I mean, if they just get the conspiracy, right. can they, can they Sentenced to death, do we know? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I, okay. I believe conspiracy carries the same penalty right, as right. the underlying charge. Yeah. So, I mean, the bottom line, though, is this is a death penalty case. So if convicted where he could be, he could be put to death, what happens after that? If there is a conviction that comes down, sentencing is a little bit different than what we saw today. It is. So what we saw today, because they took the death penalty off the table for uh, Lori, is what we see in, in any essentially felony or, or even misdemeanor case as far as sentencing go. There's a pre-trial or a, a pre-sentence investigation that's conducted. There's argument by both sides. There's victim impact statements and, and the defendant's right to testify. In a death penalty case, it becomes its own separate trial. So the penalty phase then becomes a separate trial that also has to be uh, unanimously um, found that he's mm -hmm. sentenced to death. New jury? I mean, New, we get a jury in there, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Okay, um, so basically, I mean, new evidence, maybe not new evidence, but um, new information, like you were saying, new witnesses come in or witnesses come back. Correct, the, there's, a, there's a different um, tenor to the sentencing portion than there is to the guilt phase. The guilt phase, you're just trying to establish who did it and, mm -hmm. and what happened and, and have a jury find that 
the defendant was guilty of it. In a sentencing phase, um, the role of the defense in that really is purely mitigation. Hmm. And, and that's why there's such a high burden and standards for uh, death penalty qualified lawyers because that's not something you start after conviction. That's something you start when you get the case. Right, that, sure. that you start putting together all that mitigation uh, type defense to, to put on uh, at the sentencing portion. So um, as, my, as I understand it, because he, he got longer to prepare for trial, that's why we, they were allowed to go after, the prosecutors were able to go after and make this a death penalty case, whereas Lori didn't get as much time to prepare for trial. I don't um, know that that, I, I don't know how much that factored into their decision. They, they could have just as easily, I think, pursued the death penalty uh, in her case, uh, as well as in Chad's. It, it's somewhat interesting to me that, uh, that they didn't pursue it or, mm -hmm. or choose not to pursue it in both. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, some people might wonder, could we see Lori back at this trial? Um, we could hear from her from either side. Would either side want to call Lori, do you think, to the stand? A after her statement at sentencing today, I would say no. I don't think she would be helpful to either side uh, in any way, just just based on, on the things she said. And, and mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's She's, she has some mental health diagnosis that we are aware of, mm -hmm. um, even though she didn't partake in any of the screening that could have mitigated mm -hmm. her sentence. Uh, I, I suppose we could see her as a witness. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see her being offering anything particularly helpful given the fact she doesn't, I mean, believe that anyone was murdered and people die by accident and right. they're in a better place. According so. to her statements today. Correct. Yeah, okay. Do we worry about fatigue with jury selection coming up. I mean, this has gone on for years now. Mm -hmm. um, we just went through a huge trial. Everyone was glued to the TV. Is there a worry about fatigue in any of the participants or maybe not even fatigue, but just having been exposed to this case? Well, I think given just the mass amount of exposure this case has gotten, I mean, there was the Netflix documentary that came out prior to her trial or mid-trial whenever that was released uh, and all the coverage that's gotten since then and today I think seating a jury is uh, impossible I, I don't know how else to say that I mean it was so highly publicized and the things that were said at trial uh, were so highly publicized that I think there can't be too many people left who can sit there and say I'm impartial and and, I've, and I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. You think moving it out of county, out of out of the area, helps? I think you better move it to another country. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, maybe you're better in, in smaller places. I grew up in a really small town in Montana. You know, there are people who kind of live off the grid just a little bit enough that they're not, you know, they're not at home watching mm -hmm. Netflix like the rest of us or following you know, true crime documentaries, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're farmers and ranchers and are, you know, doing whatever they do uh, aside from that. So, you know, maybe you are and are better off in, in smaller rural parts of the country. Yeah. Hey, this is a, a stupid question, but I really don't understand how this works. What happens if you can't see an impartial jury? What happens? Uh, the, do they just keep trying? You would have to just keep trying. I mean, it's your only option. Mm -hmm. And unless they're going to offer some sort of plea deal that he's going to take, but they're f this far down the road, I can't imagine they would offer him anything that wouldn't be a life without parole offer. Right. The case against her, other than her competency status, seems pretty cut and dry. Do we expect it to be very similar with him? Do you think the evidence is there to be very black and white in this? I, I think the forensic evidence and the law enforcement evidence we're going to see is going to be largely the same. And I think you're going to see some character evidence that comes in. I, it, I think it'll be interesting. We really haven't heard as much about him from the other people in his life uh, up to this point. Even before Lori was tried, there were a lot of people who had a lot to say about the kind of person she was, the way she used to be, all these mm -hmm. questions about how did this happen and what happened and how did she get here. 
I don't recall, or, or maybe it's just been overshadowed, is hearing as much about Chad. And so I think it'll be interesting what type of character type evidence or what he said to other people or conversations that he had uh, with people that is, is out there that's evidentiary value that we don't know about yet. He had a lot of writings, a lot of books. Can those be entered into evidence? Potentially. I mean, depending on the types, it, it would it's largely gonna, you know, it, I think it'd be, I think it'd be tough to get them in. One, they're hearsay; they're out of court statements, and they don't have anything to do, uh, largely, with the murder. But you know, if the if the theory is this guy subscribes to some sort of different uh, way of thinking, and and that is why he did it, or if he makes it relevant through his defense. So if somehow through the defense that comes up, then uh, that could, could make them more relevant. Um, I had one more question. Do you think it's possible um, the prosecutors could enter new evidence? Like we talk about this smoking gun. You know, there mm -hmm. was DNA of Lori. Could prosecutors withhold maybe some other evidence that they have for his trial that maybe we didn't hear or learn about in this trial? Or would it have been more likely that they would have entered it in this trial, if there is something like, right. yeah, like a piece of there, evidence like that. I think if there is something like that, we would have heard about it. Okay. Um, because I think we would have heard about it at least in the context of cross-examination from Lori's attorneys, because they would have had to have gotten all of that evidence. The prosecutor yeah. can't choose to withhold anything in the case right. okay. or, or shouldn't be withholding any evidence. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I think if there would have been something that was Chad all over it, if I'm the defense, I'm like, look, it's not my client. Like all the sure. all the forensics here point to this other guy. Sure. So I, I do think we would have heard about that. Got it. Okay.